Hi, I'm Bob Garlick, your host. Welcome to season three of the Business Book Talk podcast. On each show, we will discover another great book that can help you improve yourself and your business. So I invite you to sit back and enjoy this week's author and find out what makes this book a great read. Hi, everybody. I've got a great book in front of me called Game Theory in Management, Modeling Business Decisions and Their Consequences by Michael Hatfield. And uh, before we jump into this book, I'd just like to ask, uh, Michael, what you've been, uh, what have you been doing recently? Well, Bob, I've been actually going around and doing presentations to PMI chapters to discuss parts of the book that... Uh, <laughs> are probably most counterintuitive to the project management community at large, uh, specifically the, the risk management aspects of what is currently taught as, um, as good project management. Many of the risk management theories, as I explore in my book, are um, suspect. Mm -hmm. And so I put together a presentation that uh, I get invites from the various PMI chapters nearby and I go and uh, and put out my ideas, and um, so far, every time I've done that, I've braced for significant pushback. But it's quite the opposite. Uh, I, I find that the the project management uh, community is is very interested in in this sort of idea that you can employ something like game theory to test the efficacy of management theory. Uh, how far it goes, but more importantly, where it needs to stop, where it starts uh, stops returning usable information. Mm -hmm. And uh, the 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 people I've been speaking to have been very very rece receptive, very kind. It's hmm. uh, been a real relief. <laughs> it's, well, you know what it, you know, game theory and management, and and uh, you know, if you read the the preface of the book, I mean, it's a very technical thing that you're you're putting together so it, it's interesting that you were able to actually put it in in words and and in a way that that makes it uh more acceptable well, not acceptable easier to to consume uh for for the average business person um, most people aren't highly technical but this is quite technical the theory behind it i wanted to ask you um why did you think this book was necessary or important right these days well, it uh, it had its genesis actually in uh, two different two different occurrences. Mm -hmm. One was that I had been writing a column for PM Network Magazine, that's Project Management Institute's monthly uh, trade journal, and the name of the column was the Variance Threshold. And I they put me on the back of the the back page, and from there I got to make fun of everything in the project management world and brother was there a mother load of material there <laughs> and after uh, a decade of doing that i began to come to more complete understanding that not only do project managers have a tendency to to think very seriously about themselves and their profession but a lot of the things that were being furthered as proper business practices best business practices weren't and that's when I wrote my first book, Things Your PMO Is Doing Wrong. Mm. And that actually got on the Project Management Institute's bestseller list, after which a, a friend of mine said, oh, you mean you sold your 25th copy? <laughs> uh, okay, it's not the New York Times, but I'll, I'll take it. And I started getting a lot of feedback from people who uh, apparently that the ideas in that book really resonated. And then flash forward to the spring of 2010, my older son was getting uh, ready to graduate from the University of New Mexico, and he recommended one of his textbooks entitled A Beautiful Math by Tom Siegfried. It was essentially a review of game theory as it was refined by Thomas Nash, the subject of the movie A Beautiful Mind. Mm -hmm. And as I read that book, I began to realize that there were strong parallels between that book and what I had previously written. And it started um, 
a ball rolling. I then read The Gamesman by Michael McCoby, then Games People Play by Eric Byrne, and then, of course, Theory of Games and Economic Behavior by John von Neumann, which is pretty much the seminal work in the field of game theory. And the more I got into it, the more I realized game theory did have an awful lot to bring into the realm of management. But there was also limitations that a lot of people weren't recognizing. And then I read Nassim Taleb's book, The Black Swan, The Impact of the Highly Improbable. And I realized I had swerved onto a set of ideas, uh, tests that could check the efficacy of what these project management theories were, uh, how far they could help the practitioners, but more importantly, where they couldn't and yet were pretending to be able to. Mm. And so when I amassed that amount of research, I was finally ready to put fingers on keyboard and uh, started the, the, the manuscript. Now, you know, you use this term a lot in the book, matrix, um, you know, the payoff matrix, the pay, uh, it goes off the payoff matrix for chicken, the payoff matrix for matching pennies. I mean, it, it's, it's great, but it also makes a lot of sense because your book is very mathematically driven um, and, and very organized in that that way. Um, can we delve a little bit into the, the mathematics without basically melting people's brains? Oh, absolutely. When I was writing my, my variance threshold column, I was, um, I gained kind of a reputation for, yeah, I was trying to be funny and sometimes I actually succeeded, but most of all, I could convey insights in such a way that it doesn't become stodgy. It doesn't lead to what P.J. O'Rourke refers to as Migo for my eyes glaze over. And when I was continuing in my research with a lot of the other textbooks, I was uh, looking at about quantitative analysis and business, some of them written by uh, um, professors at very prestigious business schools. I, I encountered that just left and right, Bob. It was terrible. You almost is very wet plowing to, to try to extract exactly what are they trying to say here. And when I was learning to write, one of the things that um, a very profound influence had on me, one of the things he had said was, if you don't have a very clear and easily articulatable thought, then the first refuge is to try to obfuscate. And so I, I think you're perfectly right. Although there is a lot of math analysis in the book, I did make it a point to try to make it readable. Mm. And I, I hope I succeeded. The, uh, the subject of game theory almost begs to be conjoined with risk management theory and network theory. And the whole time I was doing my research, I found myself entering zombie-like states as, as almost as if I was disconnected from the real world, trying to sort through what are the common threads, what works, what does not. And when I finally came up with a series of ideas that would serve as easily employable acid tests, if you will, uh, it was a, a great relief. Uh, I could finally take that set of ideas, that concept forward, and brandish it against the the entire project management body of knowledge and tests for those ideas, usefulness in a, a variety of situations and environs. Um, the, I just wanted to ask you before we go too much further, because, you know, we are talking game theory and, 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 and the like, let's define that just a little bit because uh, a lot of people, when they think game theory, they think, oh, computer games, this for kids or whatever. It's a lot more sophisticated than that. It's been, long for, it's been around for a long time. It, I think it's steeped in, in military theory and trying to find out what the outcomes of uh, a series of decisions will do. What part of game theory, or how do you define game theory? Whoa, that's, that's a great question. The... I think when John von Neumann wrote 
theory of games and economic behavior, what he was addressing was the idea that if you have a, a zero-sum game in which the participants have perfect knowledge, and uh, I, like poker, for example, mm. you know what the rules of the game are, you know what the options are, you know what options are available to you, and you know what options are available to the other players in the game. Then it's possible to mathematically reduce the odds of other people employing various mixed strategies or a certain set strategy or canned strategies is what I call them in the book. And if you have, if you can compute that sort of uh, what you know the other player strategies are most likely to be, that gives you a distinct leg up. And I approached this first by discussing what happened when I was trying out for my high school's chess team. I thought I was a pretty good player, a pretty good canny sense of the game. And then I showed up to my first meeting of this chess team and my canny sense was wiped all over the chessboard. <laughs> the, the reason was because the other players were aware of a series of chess openings, uh, a set of the first 10 to 20 moves in a chess game. And these moves are, it's a set of canned strategies. And the other players had memorized these these chess openings. They, they've got names like the Rui Lopez or the Catalan. Mm. And the knowledge of those moves, that can set of strategies, starting off a chess game was invaluable. In fact, you'll rarely find a, a tournament player who does not know um, four to five variants of at least three or four openings well into the 20th move. In other words, they've memorized a set of canned strategies that they employ as soon as they see a certain set of circumstances present, in this case, on the chessboard. And then game theory then goes on to become more expansive when you look at things like the California energy crisis of the um, 1980s or 1990s. One of the key players in that was Enron. Hmm. And Enron had a set of canned strategies that they would employ, cartage schemes, if you will. And they would wait for a certain set of circumstances to present themselves within the, the electricity demand environs in California at this time, which plants were up, which were down for maintenance, which lines had been rented, which lines had been rented to the competition, and so forth. And whenever these parameters would manifest in a certain way, they could, at a moment, engage one of these cartage schemes, again, a set of canned strategies, and essentially just sit back and watch the profit meter roll at astrono astronomical rates. Mm. Well, in the case of macroeconomics, game theory is an attempt to uh, identify what the other players in the free marketplace, what strategies are available to them, and which strategies they are likely to, to employ given a certain set of circumstances. And yeah, you're quite right that the, the military uses game theory extensively. And key to the, the use of the game theory um, tactics is the payoff matrix. And as you mentioned, there are several payoff matrices in the book in which I evaluate Prisoner's Dilemma, Chicken, the Pirate's Game, and so forth. But the interesting thing about the payoff matrix is that the game has got to be reduced to a minimum number of utility uh, payoffs. And in the real world, that almost never happens. And the first game that, that kind of tipped us off that uh, game theory might have an upper limit had to do with the ultimatum game. In the ultimatum game, you have uh, two people, person A and person B, and the, the master of the game approaches them and s says to person A, I will give you uh, both $100 if you, person A, come up with a plan for distributing it that is acceptable to person B. 
Well, game theory theorized that the to maximize your payoff, person A should submit that person A receives $99 and person B receives $1. Under the theory that person B would rather walk away with $1 than nothing. So to calculate the to maximize player A's utility, their recommended strategy was player A always says I get 99 and player B gets 1. Well, a funny thing happened when player A was getting ready to go to the bank to deposit his $99. That scenario was almost never accepted. And when in, the, in real life experiments, when they actually tried similar things to the, the ultimatum game in real life. And so analysts came along later and said, okay, why is this so? And in some cases, the even a 50-50 split would be rejected by, say, some Pacific Rim cultures because person B didn't want to be seen as being in debt to person A in any way. Uh, sometimes uh, the split that was actually disadvantageous to player A was also rejected for various reasons that got encapsulated as cultural reasons. Well, the cultural reasons e e end up being the equivalent of payoff that had nothing to do with money. In some cases, the payoff being sought was avoidance of the idea that player A was 99 times more valuable a human being than player B, and that's why it would be rejected. And so as soon as it became apparent that calculations just within the realm of game theory would yield the wrong strategy for maximizing payoff, I began to realize, okay, the only reason that is so is because of the assumption that there is only one payoff. There's more payoff going on here. And when that happens, it makes it next to impossible to calculate the Nash equilibrium or even the most appropriate strategy. And then as I traced through the book, I began to realize that a lot of other computed recommended strategies suffer from the same problem. It's, it's impossible to capture all of the relevant parameters to employ those formula in order to come up with the sought after data. Well, okay. That is probably a little bit more than what we were expecting as far as a, a quick answer. <laughs> Because Sorry. no, no, that's fine. Because it's fascinating. I was getting drawn into the conversation and and, and what you were explaining. Saying, "Wow, this is like exactly what I needed to hear." Um, what I wanted to know uh, is now we kind of understand the 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 underlying uh, philosophies. Basically, it's it's um, putting together a win win scenario, and a lot of times the win win scenario isn't based on money, it's based on a, a complete understanding of what uh, values are at play, what um, profit margins are at play, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and stepping back from, from the, the, that uh, um, understanding, it's the ability to say, okay, because I'm dealing with a certain person and because this is the situation, this is the way I should play the game. That's essentially it. Yeah. And Michael McCovey's work became very important there. McCovey wrote a book entitled The Gamesman. And he theorized that there were essentially four different types of workers. He described them as the, um, the craftsman who cares very much for his output but doesn't care so much for whom he's working just as long as his output is of the highest quality. Mm. The company man, who tends to assume the persona of the macro organization around him. The jungle fighter, who tends to get ahead by calumny and by cloak and dagger sorts of tactics. And then finally, the type after whom the book is named, the gamesman. The gamesman perceives his salary and his other perks, not as uh, food on the table or a roof over his head, but rather as tokens in a, a grand game, mm -hmm. <laughs> ironically. And because 
He knows how to master the rules of the game. He tends to be more successful. He also tends to take more risks. And McCovey goes on to describe, he says that while no one person manifests in only one of those archetypes, that we do tend to gravitate towards one of those four types. And so as part of the book, I also looked into, okay, if you find you're on a project team, say, and you can identify which of the McCovey archetypes belong to the people who are sitting around you in the conference room, then you have a little bit better insight about how to get your ideas advanced or furthered based on what you know is their most likely tactic to engage in. Mm. So again, a hard game theory, as von Neumann postulated, it kind of swerved into McCovey's work. And it's just, I thought it was an interesting coincidence that the word game keeps popping up over and over in these titles. Yeah. Well, I, uh, life is a game, I guess. It depends how you look at it, right? Um, <laughs> Absolutely. I want to talk to you a little bit about the book now. Um, what's the best way to, to approach this book? Is it a book that you should read from cover to cover? Or can you say, you know what, I want to get straight into the Matrix for uh, Chicken? You could do the latter, certainly. The Some of the underlying math, though, is such that in the later chapters, I do spend so much time challenging a lot of commonly held precepts that if you're willing to go straight there and find out what is Hatfield challenging and you'll, you're willing to take me at my word, then great. But if you are more uh, of, a, of the analytical type who needs to be shown, why are these ideas invalid past this particular point, then it becomes, I think, important to at least go over some of the ideas behind the underlying logic that serves as the underpinnings for much of what passes for management theory today. For example, the when we talk about management science, the hard scientists have got to be rolling their eyes. I mean, a theory is scientific if it can be observed and if it can be repeated in an experimental setting. Well, management science, obviously we're dealing with such a, a dynamic environment that we can't possibly isolate a single causal variable and say, this is what caused the ensuing elements. I mean, we can take a guess most, much of the time. And so because of the nature of that, I had to dive all the way back into the logical underpinnings of management science and theory. And as it turns out, much of it is based on the logical argument modus ponens, which is if P, then Q, P, therefore Q. But scientists such as Karl Popper came along and said, you know what, that's a very shaky basis for advancing science. We should be engaging modus tollens, which is if P, then Q, not Q, therefore not P. And if you look at the sorts of theories that can be falsified via modus tollens, the, the body of management science that is susceptible to um, an invalid logical base is vast. And when I swerved into that little factoid, I was astonished myself, but the more I pulled that thread, the more I realized it was so. And so, yeah, you can, you can skim over the book and pick out the, the chapters that you want, but um, I would ask if you, if you do so and then get to one of the latter chapters, and I seem to be blowing up some deeply held theory, uh, don't just disregard it. Go back and <laughs> check the, the discussion on the logical underpinnings. Okay, well, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your aha moment because you know, you read a lot of material uh, before, like you said, getting onto the, uh, onto the keyboard. When you started putting the book together, what was your aha moment? What was things like, oh, wow. My aha moment came actually uh, a couple of years before 
I started uh, writing the book, I was a project controls manager for a company that was engaged in environmental restoration. And the part of this one project was to drill a test well at a certain location to check the aquifer for the existence of contaminants. And about halfway into the drill, the cost just started skyrocketing. Um, and so the, the customer sent an auditor out and the auditor wanted to know what was wrong. Well, the auditor asked, did you guys perform a risk analysis on this task? Well, as it turned out, we had. I had written a, a computer program that performed a single tier decision tree analysis based on a Primavera project planner schedule and it issued a, a notebook full of these risk analysis scenarios. And the particular project controller involved, she went to the binder, she looked it up, and she said, yes, here it is. And there it was. It, it was an analysis that said, if we are drilling through this tough and we happen to hit shale, the, the price could go up by millions and it could delay us weeks. Well, that's exactly what had happened. And so the auditor did something that I found that was my aha moment. He asked for a copy of that report. He thanked us and he left. And two weeks later, the check for the entire amount of the overrun was in the mail. And I got to thinking, what if we had not done that analysis? Would it have changed a thing? And the answer is no. I mean, we couldn't have moved the test well elsewhere. We had to know what was in that aquifer. And we couldn't have changed the technical approach at all. We had to keep drilling. It made absolutely no difference that we had known that. And yet, had we not produced that report to the auditor, there's no question in my mind they'd have raked us over the coals. And so the more I got to thinking about it, the more I came up with my first acid test that risk management techniques, as advocated, actually don't help unless they change the response of the project team to a risk event. Other than that, risk analysis through the lifetime of a project is little more than institutionalized worrying. And then from that aha moment, I started to question, okay, what about these other assertions that we're just supposed to know is, is inherently true about management. And the next aha moment came when I did a piece that challenged the old idea that the point of all management is to maximize shareholder wealth. Well, if the point of all management is to maximize shareholder wealth, then how does one explain the hostile takeover? Because in a hostile takeover, Oftentimes what happens just before the takeover occurs is the target company's stock prices go up. Okay, well, if that's the case, then no company would ever attempt to perform a hostile takeover and no target company would ever resist if the only point was to maximize shareholder wealth. There are obviously more parameters going on in here than can be explained by that little axiom of management science. So the more I began to examine some of these long-standing theories that had become, in that case, axiomatic, the more I realized there's a, a lot here that needs to be challenged, at least to the point that somebody can draw a line and say, this management theory is good in these environments, in these conditions, and no further. Nobody ever attempted to draw the, the upper limit to their efficacy. And so that's what I tried to do. Those were my aha moments when I began to realize much of what parades as legitimate management science is anything but. Hmm. It's almost like you do a risk management assessment for doing a risk, ma risk management, management <laughs> assessment. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, you know, listen to the, the, this stuff. It seems very applicable to the book and the theory and all that stuff to somebody that is uh, – actively involved in risk management and, and utilizing risk management as, as part of their, their management structure. But should people that aren't in risk management be reading a book like this to kind of understand why and how risk management can, can be used in, in strategic ways? 
Oh, absolutely. Um, and the, this book is divided into three parts. And after I, the first part is devoted to examining the, the, how risk management, game theory management, network theory, how all of those are, are currently used and how they ought to be used. The second part of the book says, okay, but here is their upper limit. Here is why they have an upper limit. And then in the third part of the book, I go ahead and assert a model. I call it the corner cube model or corner cube theory. And it's predicated on the idea that asset management, project management, and strategic management are completely and utterly different. They have different tools. They have different goals. And tools that are germane to one of those three areas does not work in the other two. And yet proponents of those tools or those theories will often try to push their efficacy past their legitimate limits. And that part of the book, I think the third part is extremely valuable, I, in my humble opinion, to a variety of industries. Because when, um, for example, currently quantitative analysis um, on Wall Street, they pour through tons and tons of data looking for a causal loop between something happening in one arena having a predictable impact in another and then take advantage of that in economic space. Well, Nassim Taleb in his book, The Black Swan, likens that to snatching nickels from the path of oncoming steamrollers. And so what the third part of my book does is it offers a structure for evaluating where you are with respect to your assets, your customers, and your competition. And then I pull back in game theory and risk management theory to show that they should be used not in a vain attempt to quantify the future, but rather to test for robustness. Because my, my final theme is robustness in response is far, far more valuable than trying to predict what is likely to occur. And so if for no, no other purpose than the, the, certainly the third part of the book would be va very valuable to strategic managers and, and project managers because there's, there's really a very, I don't know, vague line of delineation between what is the proper role of a project management office within the macro organization as opposed to the chief financial officer or as opposed to the chief uh, executive officer what is PM's precise role in organizational behavior and performance space? And that debate is very has a very mushy middle. Instead, I take it to what is project management's proper role in information stream space? That can be very clearly delineated, and that's what I do. Um. With project management and, and risk assessment and stuff like that, I think a lot of that has to do with belief in the final report or belief in the presentation of that data. Um, and if you muddy up the water with too much technical mumbo jumbo, people go, well, okay, but we don't really have a core understanding, so how can we truly believe in it? Or if you oversimplify, then they don't take it as, uh, as powerful a tool as it actually is. In the book, do you enable people to present this type of data, this type of data to uh, potential targets at, uh, or markets or to boards uh, in a more succinct way? Oh, absolutely. Um, besides overturning, uh, well, <laughs> actually in that debate, I am in the, uh, the happy position of not having to delve into massive statistical models in order to justify my approach because the I think the the ultimate truth here is that the future cannot be quantified at least not with any accuracy at all and the it's the risk management um, crowd's position that by using Gaussian curves the rules of probability and statistics that the future can be somewhat quantified. I mean, per perhaps not precisely, but at least 
accurately enough to know how to guide your decisions concerning project execution. And so I just, ha all I need to do is sit back and say, well, that's not consistently logical, whereas they have got to make the argument, well, uh, not only is it, it can we logically assert that the future can be quantified, but we can show how the use of Gaussian curves achieves that. And yet there was, I remember reading, oh darn it, I, I forgot the fellow's name. He wrote an, uh, an article in which he posited, he asserted flat out, there's not a single major project that can point to any significant savings in time or cost as a direct result of their risk management system. None at all. And Taleb goes even further. He asserts that the idea that business decisions can be used based on Gaussian curve analysis is the great intellectual fraud of the 20th century. And so I don't go that far, and it's a little bit harsh, um, and besides, Taleb is way, way smarter than I am. But it does put me in a position to say, look, this is what project management in general, and then some specific areas like the risk managers and the quality managers and so forth, this is what they have asserted is a valid and useful approach to performing management functions, to have your, your decisions guided by a quantitative analysis. Okay. Here are some examples where it flat doesn't work the way they say it does. And so I could have just left it there. Look, it doesn't work the way they say it does. But I thought that was a little bit intellectually disingenuous. And so I went ahead and delved into this is what this is how their theories work. And this is where they fall short. And why it falls short in theoretical space. This is why they fall short in real world application space. And so uh, I, I'd welcome the responses along those lines. However, I have not received that. I actually blog on a project management site, and I've been trickling out some of these ideas. And my last blog, I out, out and out said, look, I've been making these assertions for some time, and I'm just waiting for someone from the risk management field to step up and say, no, that's, that's completely wrong, and here's why. And it hasn't happened. And nor has it happened in any of the, the PMI chapter meetings I've attended. And I know I'm in the room with some heavy hitting risk management types, they, they won't step up. And so, yeah, um, the, the shorter, quicker answer to your question is, yeah, there's a lot of content in the book that's much, much more readily uh, transmittable to your um, the typical managers out there. But if we do have to get down and dirty into the underpinnings of the logic and the, the actual quantitative analysis, I don't shrink from that either. I mean, it's both in there. Yeah. It, what I find fascinating about this stuff is that it's theory. And, and, you know, people forget, like, I mean, game theory in management. Well, management of crisis situations, 99% of the time, the reason they're having these analyses done so that they can have the opportunity to discuss and come up with a strategy for oh, what happens if this happens. Well, let's discuss it now that we have time because when that crisis happens, we might not have the opportunity for all of us to get in the same room and say, what would we do if this happens? It would be that great book, uh, What Would Google Do? And, right. <laughs> and it, it's that I think a lot of the time that is where the core value is. Like it's, it, it's kind of perceived as a looking glass concept with mathematics behind it and saying, okay, well, with these maths and these theories, we have a, you know, 60, 40 chance of this happening. So just so you guys know, this could happen. It sounds horrible, but it could happen. What are you going to do about it? Um, so, so yeah, my question is, is, is that how people perceive uh, like in upper management that aren't actually doing this? How do they see the value? How do they perceive the value of it? That is what you just said is spot on. In fact, part of the research I did was Eric Byrne's classic Games People Play. And in that book, the Byrne posits that we run narratives in our head, scripts, and these scripts have a series of functions. He describes them as manifesting in the three persona, which are crypto 
Freudian instead of id, ego, superego. Burns said we had the inner child, the inner adult, and the inner parent. And what these scripts do is they explain to us why our past unfolded the way it did. And that serves, that creates the basis for our our experience, our judgment, our wisdom. Where we get into trouble is when we take that narrative and then we flip it forward of the time now line. And now it's not describing to us how our past has unfolded. It's explaining to us how we expect our future to unfold. The problem is we have so many cognitive biases, so many confirmation biases in that narrative that it's not useful for projecting the future occurrence. I mean, why else would do you suppose we would have the Groundhog Day celebration? I mean, at some po point in the past, somebody made a connection between the um, the behavior of a large squirrel leaving its burrow and subsequent weather patterns. Okay, who who makes that connection? Well, okay, we kind of laugh at it now. It's cute, but we all carry around with us the uh, causal loops that don't really exist. There was a, a famous email that was going around. It was a, put together by a college professor. It was the history of the world as derived from snippets of his students' essays. And it was, it was a pretty funny group of uh, misconceptions. But one of them stuck out in my head. It was... Uh, John Milton wrote Paradise Lost. Then his wife died and he wrote Paradise Regained. <laughs> and although th that's technically true, that's it's not indicative of what Milton thought of matrimony. And so we all have this in our head, things that happen to us sequentially in time. There's a tendency to draw a causal loop between them. And so if we see the predecent activity happen again, we tend to anticipate the following activity, which could be argued as the entire basis for Skinner and behaviorism. But in management science space, if we're in a, a group, a group of people in a room and we're discussing what's going to happen if this crisis unfolds, okay, great. Then we have a handle on a, perhaps a robust plan. The crisis, though, is not when something in, we anticipate happens. It's when something nobody anticipated happens, and we don't have a robust response in place. You know what? It, it's true, but I would counter that saying that an organization that doesn't do the exercises will run into a lot more crises than an organization that uh, has planned for a, a certain set of crises. Well, perhaps. The, uh, the very definition of a black swan event is that nobody could have anticipated it, but then after the fact, there is a natural tendency in us to look back and say, oh, yeah, we could have anticipated that. Well, no. And so when you have a, a project and they've, got, they've selected a technical approach and they're pursuing that technical approach, usually the, the management and or at least the, the principals on the project team have experienced enough of this type of project or this type of technical approach to know what are the unusual things that are likely to occur, and if they occur, how they will respond, robust response. And it's a, it's a tendency, though, in us to, to want to reach our brains into the future, try to capture what's going to happen, try to quantify it, try to imagine what we're going to do in response. And when those things are largely negative, largely negative impacts to your project, that's analogous to a, an individual worrying. You're, you're projecting to the future, potentially bad things, and devoting energy and time to how will you respond if this happens. Well, worrying is a waste of time to us personally, and I would argue to the macro organization as well. Yeah, absolutely. Michael? I could go on like this all day. It's <laughs> fascinating stuff. Uh, your book, Game Theory and Management, Modeling Business Decisions and Their Consequences, highly recommended. Fascinating stuff. And um, maybe we'll have you come on and talk about your first book. 
Oh, that'd be great, Bob. I really appreciate the opportunity to do that. All right. Now, where can people go to get more information? Do you have a? Uh, you've mentioned a blog a couple times. You're you're writing for other people. Do you have a, a blog specific for this book, or do you recommend they go to uh, your other blogs? I would recommend they go to projectmanagement.com. The name of the blog is Game Theory and Management. And I explore not only things that are already in this book, but uh, additional material, additional research I've done since then. And I welcome the, the exchange for, from people, real world practitioners. Projectmanagement.com used to be Ganthead, and so it's an information technology uh, project management site. And those people are, they're just, they're first rate and their subscribers are very quick and very insightful. And it, it's a lot of fun to, um, more information on the book. I, I just learned today that, uh, Project Management World did a review on the book and I haven't read that review yet. The American Society for the Advancement of Project Management did a review of the book. Dr. Kenneth Smith did it and... That's available if you uh, go over to asapm.com and book reviews. And the book itself, of course, is available through Gower Publishing or its um, uh, United States affiliate, Ashgate. Mm -hmm. And on Amazon, too. And on Amazon and yep. Barnes & Noble. Yep. Yeah. Michael, thank you very much for spending some time with us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Bob. I really appreciate your time as well. That was an awesome book. We have some great new books and authors for you to meet in the coming shows, and I know you will enjoy them immensely. You can contact me directly at contactbob.tell or visit our website at www.businessbooktalk.com. See you next week.